morning. My name is Jeremy Wife. I'm President and CEO of Treasury Metals. Uh, we recently published a resource update, and we are really happy to spend a couple of minutes taking you through that. With me, I have Moira Kolb, our Director of Exploration, and Eben Fisser, our Director of Projects. Great. Um, Jeremy, thank you so much. Really nice to meet you all. Um, Maura, Eben, good to have you on board. Uh, we've got about half an hour, maybe 40 minutes to go through uh, your recent um, MRE, understand the geology, understand your approach to the project. Um, I'm relatively new to the company, so I'm afraid you're going to have to uh, live with my ignorance and educate me as best as you can in a shorter space of time. Um, so why don't we just kind of kick straight off with that, Jeremy? Could you just give me a um, kind of an overview of kind of what you've really been focused on in the last 18 months and where you've got to kind of today. Absolutely, Nolan. If we go back to August of 2020, we acquired Goldland, and this provided for us the critical mass to take this project forward. So we went into 2021 for the first time, we released a PEA that combined both Goliath and Goldland. And this showed a real solid base of economics uh, with leverage to gold price. Uh, we Hang raised on. money. Sorry, so just just Goliath and Goldland, uh, they were two kind of known gold assets. Kind of wh 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 where are they and what kind of, uh, wh wh what are they? Right, both, both are in northwestern Ontario. Um, the, Treasury Metals has had the Goliath Gold Project for, for many years. And we acquired a neighboring property from First Mining called Goldland. So we've now put the two together, which has given us that critical mass. So you've got a kind of a land package now, which stretches kind of a regional structure or a regional trend. You've got a regional play now. Absolutely. We've got 65 kilometers of strike and 330 square kilometers of land package now, which is quite significantly larger than what we had uh, earlier in 2020. Sorry for the interruption, but thank you. That's, that was really helpful. No problem. We, um, we then raised, straight after the PEA, we raised money. We embarked on a 60,000-meter drill program. And really, and Moira can talk to it, but to increase geological confidence and grow the results. And what was really important for us was putting um, the two uh, deposits together in one model. Um, I went through a process of assembling a team of mine builders. Uh, all the people on this team now have either built or run mines. So it's, it's quite a different setup to what we were before. Uh, Moira will talk to integrating the data sets and models from Goliath and Goldland. And from that, we've now embarked on a generative exploration program to identify new targets and you will have seen recently in two recent press releases of two new discoveries that we've had based on this combination of that model. So I think it's fair to say, Merlin, 2021, the team, the TML team achieved its objectives. All of those that we've spoken to there were set out at the beginning of the year and achieved. Yeah. For 2022, we've just released the mineral resource uh, update. Um, we've also just, in the last two weeks, uh, closed a, a royalty deal with Sprott that will fund us through to a construction decision. So we that's, not, a, that's, a, that's a $20 million financing. $20 million US financing, which is sufficient to take us all the way through now to a construction decision. Just, just, just on the, so I'm, for my benefit, I'm going to call it the MRE2, the Mineral Resource Estimate 2, which is the one that you've just published. Um, that incorporated the 60, most of the 60,000 metres that was drilled last year. It incorporated about just over 40,000 metres of what was drilled. I think the whole world at the moment, or I know definitely in Canada, we're going through a, a challenge to get assays out of the labs. Everyone is so busy that we've seen delays in getting that out. We're pretty confident, though, that we've got the bulk of the conversion drilling through the laboratories. And what I like about that is as we move forward now into pre-fees and fees, we still have opportunity to bring some of that additional drilling in. And one of the commitments we made a year ago was that we would grow this resource from PEA to PFS to FS. So yeah. we've shown that now. 
and we plan to do that in the next phase as well. And the the, the, the twenty million dollar, uh, you say it's got enough to get you through to financing, but it might not have enough. It, it slightly depends on the um, on what Maura and her team discover, because you know if if, if geology is an open ended. Um, it's an open-ended subject and exploration is an open-ended game or business. And, you know, if you find more stuff, you might end up needing to do more drilling and you might, depending on where you're going to put the envelope of your mineralization, it might change your timetables. And if you've got a build team on board already, you know, your GNA, maybe 20 million isn't the last financing you'll ever do before an equity construction. No, absolutely, Merlin. That 20 million is predominantly for the permitting, um, the community work, the studies, the engineering studies, and GNA. We raised six and a half million dollars of flow through funding at the end of last year to fund Moira's drilling program for this year. And as we said before, if we, as we get more results back, if we get some really good results, uh, we would look to go to the market again and raise additional flow through funding. But that would be the, the, the 20 million would be the hard dollar requirement to take us through to a construction decision. Okay, so that's, that's kind of your, that's your study in GNA. Correct. Um, and, that, that, and, and, and it, it doesn't cover the discretionary uh, additional exploration, which may or may not be required or wanted or desired. Absolutely. And, and I'm actually hoping we get some really good results and we do go out and raise them all because that'll all be additional upside for us in the feasibility study. Yeah. This yeah. year, Moira's got a 25,000 meter pro program, uh, mainly generative exploration, which is underway. And right now we are continuing with um, all our permitting activities and our discussions with the local community. So all of that is continuing. Uh, once we get to the PFS, and, and Yerbin can talk more to the, the process there, once we get to that phase, which will be second half of the year, uh, we'll have the actual project definition, which allows us to get into a lot more detail on both the permitting and the community discussions. Good. Um, thank you. That So... 25,000 meters of drilling, you've still got some drilling, some uh, 20 odd thousand meters of holes that weren't incorporated in the last mineral resource. Um, you're going to be drilling through the rest of this year, uh, or for much of this year. Um, you're talking about a pre feasibility study, and the, the, the extra drilling is that, um, I mean, you, you said that quite a lot of that 25,000 meters is generated for drilling. So, are you are you happy? Are you going to be basing your PFS on the resource that just has just come out? Absolutely. Okay. Good. Well, um, Jeremy, thank you very much for the um, uh, for the scene setting. Um, I'm not. I will come back to you, but if I may, um, Maura, um, geology. Uh, kind of, what are we dealing with here? We, you know, are these kind of? Tell me, Archean something or other. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Um, we have two different deposits here with two different styles of mineralization. So for Goliath, we're looking at a VMS that's been overprinted by later Archean deformation. So it's a, a little hybrid of VMS style and Archean gold. Um, it gives us really nice strike and dip continuity. So we have a very continuous plane uh, that's then been, the, the higher grade has kind of been uh, turned into shoots by the second generation uh, deformation. We do see a nice halo mineralization here. Uh, the alteration is really easy to see in the course. That, that's nice visual um, that the geologist can pick right out as soon as we see the, the core. Um, but the high grade mineralization is also visual. So we see an increase in sulfide mineralization, especially sphalerite, and then we know we're into the higher grade gold. Um, okay. Now, because of that, we were able to do uh, a different interpretation than the previous uh, mineral update. We um, we captured the high grade mineralization with discrete wireframes. And then the low grade mineralization, again, because it's very distinguishable, we captured that with low grade uh, wireframes. And then- when you say, you know, Sorry, when you say low, low grade, what do you mean? Uh, so above cutoff, essentially, we're kind of looking at any of the mineralization within that alteration halo, um, you know, to about our two point, sorry, 0.25 uh, gram material. Um, <clears throat> And so we were able to capture that geologically and then use that for the resource estimate. 
remind me the bands of low grade. So from w at what level is cut off and what's um, our, our cut off um, grade the, is the, the, the bottom of your high grade band. So if you've got low grade and high grade, what are your various bands? Certainly. So we, we used the geologic principles first, uh, but the, the range would be, you know, our cutoff grade is uh, 0 0.25. So we would look to our material, you know, up to 0.1 uh, to include in those lower grade wire frames. And then with the high grade, we're looking at a one gram to where we have very high grade. Um, and that's more narrow, um, and, but, but continuous and captured within side of the low grade halos. Does that make sense? I, not quite. I didn't. Um, so your, what's your lower? I mean, you, you've got um, detection limits of 0.1, but your cutoff for your resource is 0 0.25 grams per ton. Correct. Oh, two, one. So 0 0.25 to one. Is that what you meant? Because it says 0 0.75 of a gram range. Right. Sorry, right. my fault. No, no, that, that's okay. It, it's <laughs> of talking two things. So that's all right. So we tried to use this, um, we talked with SRK, which is our, our uh, QP for the resource, about the best way to capture what we think is going on geologically, and then how to represent that in the block model. So that's what we chose for Goliath. Now with gold line, we have a very different style of mineralization. It is an Archean deposit, uh, but it's related to competency contrast between a granitoid body and your uh, intermediate to mafic flows. So we have a stockwork type veining system um, with multiple orientations of veins. So that can be a bit chaotic and certainly hard to capture in a wireframe. Um, and then we have a sulfide mineralization that permeates the host rock and you also see it with the veins. So for Goldland, there was only a few areas where we could really um, capture high grade wireframes. And that's at that close contact in zone one where we have a lot of mineralization happening at the contact of the granitoid and the mafic rocks. Uh, other than that, we used a probabilistic approach to bin you know, high, medium, um, low grade. And I don't remember the bins off the top of my head if you ask, sorry. Um, no, no, I won't. I won't. <laughs> for, for, that, for that probabilistic <laughs> model. Um, but we used that to then decide what blocks would be high, medium, low grade. And then they were estimated in those three bins. Um, so that was the same approach that was used in the past, other than where we had the continuity and understanding of the high grade in zone one, we captured that in a high grade wireframe to uh, reduce spreading of high grade. So, you know, we're, we, we took a more conservative, conservative approach overall to make sure that we were, you know, doing the geology the best justice it could. Also at Goldland, we spent a lot of time going through um, pulling old holes and looking at the geologic controls of mineralization. So we reinterpreted the different um, the different zones by the different styles by their host rock um, and also the the structures. So we do have a few different cross cutting faults that kind of cross the stratigraphy, um, and we we broke the zones up with those. So all the um, all the blocks are contained within those lower grade um, mineralized zones. Okay, gotcha. Um, and just 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 for my orientation, so Gold Lund was the asset that you you pulled in into 2020. So um, and Goliath is the VMS with the Archean overprint. When did you start working on Goliath? I mean, how what's your kind of background with with that asset? So I joined Treasury at the end of May in 2021. So uh, my background, I previously worked for uh, eight or so years in Red Lake, so not too far away. Uh, very high grade gold, Archean gold. Um, so it was a, a crash course for me learning from the geology team uh, at, at Treasury um, and working with them on some of the, you know, changes I thought we could, we could in, put in place to even improve the geology uh, at the two deposits. When you joined, were, 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 there, were the data sets quite um, disparate from gold lands. I mean, was the, the 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 names of the rocks, the types of the alteration, and I know that they are different, but was the way that the data was handled in the two areas um, sufficiently different for you to want to kind of have a common approach to how data was handled? Absolutely. So one of the first things we did was um, pick an, a logging software that could handle all of the data easily. And we have two different sites. So something that was um, usable uh, cloud-based. So we switched to MX deposits and then we reset the bar for, for both deposits, came up with one uh, logging scheme so that we could talk the rocks between the entire belt together because 
you know, we have this 65 kilometer strike length now, um, and we want to be able to have all the geologists understand what all the rocks look like and call everything the same name. So we went through and, and changed all of that. Um, it was about six months of work to get it all amalgamated into the, the clean one system, and then to get all of the alterations uh, added and, and all of the, the assays uploaded. Um, but now we have one system for all the logging and all of our exploration targets. You know, we have the one pick list to choose from for those rock types. Um, as well, we, we put together one regional model um, using LeapFrog to, to look at the entire belt and all the data points we have, and then started working on generative targets from that, um, which was it's really nice to look at the entire belt and start thinking, I mean, we're not 100% there yet, but start thinking about how these deposits fit together and where the other future you know, discoveries will be lurking. And is the, um, is the overprint on Goliath, is that the same, uh, you called it an Archean over overprint, is that the same kind of, do you believe it's the same phase, the same process that created the gold mineralization at Goldland? I do. I believe it's in that same stage of deformation where you had the Archean gold deposits at Goldland forming. Um, so what we're looking for in, in future exploration targets are where there'll be some additional, um, I'm hoping for high grade uh, gold deposits within that kind of Archean system. So you um, you like that the competency contrast in, 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 in those kinds of rocks, you're presumably got a handle on kind of regional structure, favorable uh, fault orientations, secondary structures, tertiary structures, so you're looking and what are your tools that you use for this? Presumably geochemistry and geophysics and a, hopefully a bit of geological mapping, but I don't know what the cover situation is like. Yes, absolutely. Maybe I'll pull up the geologic map uh, just so I can also show a bit to go along with my words. <laughs> so um, Goldland kind of in the middle of the page here, Goliath down to the south. Um, both hosted in the same overall greenstone belt. <clears throat> mm. For cover, we have great geophysical cover of this entire belt. Um, there has been you know, a good amount of previous mapping. So we've integrated all of that in our initial data compilation. And then there's some areas where we know we'd like to get into. And uh, as soon as the snow melts here, and I don't know if you've heard, but we have about six feet of snow this year in Dryden. So as it's melting here, We'll, uh, we'll get out onto the ground and start to go and revisit some of these areas. Um, and, you know, you know, us geologists uh, lick rocks and, and do all of that that we do. Um, um, have you got, have you got um, glacial till cover here? What's, you know, what's, what's your, the, the rock exposure or the outcrop situation like? Uh, we've got probably, I'd say about 20% covered, uh, or sorry, outcrop. Um, because it's kind of ridge and valley, we do have some nice outcropping, especially of those granitoid bodies. So we're able yeah. to see some of those. And then, you know, we do have swamp cover. So some of the areas, especially the east side of the Goliath property, uh, that has a lot of cover. So we've we've used the geophysics as a really helpful tool there. And we've done some drill programs, you know, without having outcrops to, to support them, but just based on the geophysics. Um, we find for Goliath that... Um, the, the soil geochemistry has been really helpful. We, so we've done an entire, the entire property with that. We have a lot of different anomalies that, that show up right over top of the known deposit. And then we've used those uh, outside of that to, to generate these targets along with the geophysics. And you know, you'll see we have them over top of uh, Fold Nose, Far East, the Syncline, Gossin, um, and, and we're, we're targeting those uh, anomalies. So each of those each of those red dots is a, a, an area where you're going to be doing an exploration program during the course of 2022. Exactly. Or we have already done a little bit of work in 2021. So um, on the Goldland trend, we were able to target Ocelot and Caracal um, late in the year last year. And we, we published those results on the last two press releases, uh, new discoveries. So we're actually... Um, going to be mobbing up to those to go back and do a follow-up program uh, next week uh, and, and drill those. They're very similar to Goldland, and, and we were able to see that through geophysical anomalies and where we saw those cross-cutting faults uh, and, and the disruption that we see at, at uh, Goldland. So we'll be following those up again. Um, where we see something very interesting here is uh, in the south between these two uh, plutons, we have uh, very tightly folded rocks, which you really don't see in this geologic map. So that's where we're going to go back in boots on the ground, uh, try to improve the geologic map from, the, from you know, outcrop mapping. Um, what we see in the geophysics, 
is that that is tightly folded. We're, we're partnered right now with Mira Geoscience to reprocess the data through there and try to um, you know, tighten up our interpretation of where we might want to go drilling. Because um, to me, that seems like the place where you'd have potential for high grade within that um, mafic to intermediate flows and you know, typical Archean kind of beauty place to go hunting. And um, you, you spoke a little bit about um, the Archean structure and the kind of the fabric. Does this mean that there's um, pronounced um, plunging shoots of mineralization? Do you look for a kind of a halo and within that these high grade kind of steeply dipping um, sub parallel? That shoots? is exactly, that is exactly what we're looking for. So there in the interlake target, and then uh, in the fold nose. Um, in the fold nose, we see some typical Goliath style of mineralization. So our typical felsic host rock that we see the um, VMS in. But we've also noticed that we're, we're seeing vein mineralization in um, the metased, uh, metasedimentary rocks. So I'm thinking there, we do have that more Archean style. And right now the team is diligently working on interpreting that and what it means. And I just, just, just as a recap, just come to simplify things for, for for my own mental processing if no one else's um goliath you've got about 105 in, in your latest measured and indicated category you've got 105,000 ounces at a grade of 1.33 grams per ton gold and then at goldland you've got um 940,000 ounces at 0.87 so you've got a a, a bigger resource but at a lower grade and does that um to get it into a measured indicated category, you have to put on uh, these um, modifying factors, the economic constraints. So presumably um, that resource is largely what falls into a kind of a conceptual open pit. Is, 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 is that right? Yeah, yeah. correct. Go with that, Evan? Yeah, no, that's that's 100% correct. Man. And what, um, you know, 100,000 ounces of 1.33, 105,000 ounces of 1.33, it's a good start. Um, does the resource go down? Does it, does it just not get drawn down because of the geometry? Um, and is it the geometry at Goldland, which is favorable? You've got greater widths. Um, when you describe this kind of relatively chaotic veining system in a, in a, in a, I, I, I was thinking that would be in the kind of the more fractured granitoid um, than perhaps the, the mafix, which might have better strain partitioning or, um, you know, what are the geometries like at Goldland, which separates it from uh, With Goliath? Goldland, we have a bunch of parallel uh, um, granitoid intrusions as well. So that is helpful for giving that, <clears throat> that width to the pit that you see. Um, we have um, in the mafic intrusions, there's, there, sorry, in the mafic flows, there are also um, dike intrusions coming off of those bigger granitoids. And we're seeing mineralization associated with those. So we get more diffuse mineralization in that kind of in-between area. Um, zone one has a parallel zone, zone two, just uh, above it. So you kind of have the mafic in between and then the two granitoids uh, on either side bounding it. That's in gold, Goldland. In Goldland, yeah. And, and and you said it was on the boundary of zone, zone one that you got the best grades. Yes. Okay. And when you are drilling out an ocelot and caracal and you you say you've got a kind of got a new discovery what's what's what do your what's your th process what do you think right this has got to go to the board of directors this counts as a discovery hole do you look for a hundred gram meters or do you look for something different well for, for those two they had never been drilled before so um from a geophysical anomaly to having mineralization in the first drill program, that's what we've considered discovery. And now we're going back to, to drill them um, to see if we can prove them into a deposit. Okay, so you, um, uh, you got mineralization of a kind of a few tens of meters and you got a, a few um, relatively short sections, but with some nice high grades. Um, you know, it, it showed that you had a mineral system. We have the mineral system, exactly. So we've seen, um, you know, as soon as we saw the core, we said, oh, this looks an awful lot like Goldland. Excellent. We were really pleased. And then to have the results come back, um, some were quite low grade mineralization of, you know, 0.2 over a meter, but that's showing we're in the system. Um, of course, I can't, the, the grade of the best hole is eluding me at the moment, but um, we're pleased that we have the mineralized system. Now it's kind of proving up where the high grade cores are compared to the, the smoke. And remind me, was it, do you, does, is the high grade associated with Svalorite in both Goliath and Goldland or? 
At Goldland, we're more associated with pyrite uh, and the veining. Okay, and so that's that's the the the, the visual clue that gives you the uh, the encouragement. Oh, look, this is a kind of a repeat uh, of the kind of Goldland style. I mean, ideally, what you want to do is find another Goldland. I mean, as a start, um, yeah. because to get another million ounces at close to a gram a ton would um, could only help. It could only help. We're also planning some more meters. I mean, with the ten thousand meters of drilling to have another pit in indicated, uh, we take that. That's quite good. Yeah, of course. Think, Sorry, Jeremy. Well, and what you know, if we look at Muller, it was an initial resource in the PEA, and it was all inferred at that stage. And we've done a it's about a ninety percent conversion, so seventy nine thousand ounces of inferred. With an extra, that was with 7,000 meters of drilling. With another 3,000, we've converted that to 74,000 ounces um, of indicated. And that's where we see the future of Golden, is finding these high-grade cores. And then, you know, with the discoveries, we've now found we're in the system. Now we just need to find that core. And, you know, it's not often you can drill 10,000 meters and put 75,000 ounces into indicated into a mine plan. So that's exciting yeah. for us. It, yeah. And would it make sense to put up, a, we've actually got the table of Goliath and Goldland with the, the resource numbers, or do you, how do you feel? Well, let's have a quick look at it since you've suggested it. Let's, let's bring it up. Um, it's, I think it'll be worth pointing out the grades at um, Miller as well, which is 1.1 gram a ton. Uh, Laura, is that within your remit? Yep. Does the resp uh, responsibility does. fall to you? I think it does. There we go. Okay, so the, the Goliath. Oh, look, no, no, that is useful because I can see you've got a, um, a kind of a, an underground extension at Goliath at six grams a ton, and the open pit is there at. Uh, 1.2 grams a ton. So it's useful to see that split out. Um, in the indicated resources, Goliath open pit, uh, 0.75. That's quite a difference, isn't it, between the grade, between the indicated and the measured. Uh, Maura, do you want to mention, you know, talk around that? We did a lot of converting of the higher grade into measured there. Um, so that, that does speak to why the, the measured is higher grade. Okay, so you 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 focus, you pull a lot of the high grade material into the measured, which leaves kind of a relative um, depletion of the of the indicated resources of the high grade. So that brings the the overall grade lower. Great. Okay, yeah, understood. We wanted to make sure that continuity of the high grade was was really true, and, and we were pleased with the infill drilling uh, proving that up. Okay, and then moving on to Goldland, I see you've got a cutoff grade of 0.3 grams a ton, which is higher than the open the 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 Goliath open pit grade. And is that just a function of the natural distribution of mineralization or is that some other reason why you've chosen that higher cutoff grade there? So the, the higher cutoff grade is really driven um, by a couple of things. One being the metallurgy that we see at Goldland. We've done quite a lot of test work in the last six months. Um, and then also the, the cutoff grade of 0.3 also reflects some of the um, cost we, we see with exploiting that open pit, um, including haulage down to Goliath and the process facility. Okay, good. Um, great, thank you. And then there's Miller open pit again at 0.3 because it's a little bit further away from um, Goliath, grade 1.1. Yeah. Um, good. And the inferred resources, Goliath open pit, uh, 70,000 ounces, Goliath, Godland open pit, 680,000 ounces. Okay, so you've got lots of, um, you know, got it's almost 25% uh, in sitting in kind of the inferred resources that you could target as a kind of a, um, a potential increase uh, to the overall asset base. But perhaps it might be easier to, or, or better value to find more, ocelots and caracals and build resources around that which is sitting closer to the surface yeah. exactly merlin we're, we're thinking we want to go after material closer to surface uh, for additional pits um, rather than drilling depth at uh, goldland or, or even goliath at this point i think it makes more sense and we'll get more value 
Great. We, um, we're actually waiting for results at the moment from Falmos and Far East, which are right next to Goliath and close to surface and have been drilled in the past, Merlin, but no follow-up was ever done. So Moira has put some holes into it. Some of the initial logging is showing very, very similar material to Goliath. So we're actually pretty excited about getting those results back. And um, Moira, does that have um, sphalerite in there? I'm, I'm, I'm clinging on to sphalerite <laughs> as, my, as, my, as my guide to high-grade gold. Yeah, so at, at Far East, it's looking really similar to Goliath. Uh, we have the same kind of alteration, uh, the same mineralization. So we're, we're pretty excited that it looks like it could be, you know, analogous to Goliath. And then at Fold Nose, we have uh, a little bit of that felsic host rock, but I think it's more related to an Archean style deposit. So we've seen veins, which we don't typically see at Goliath in some of the metasedimentary rock uh, and mafic rock. So that to me could be exciting, but for a different reason. Um, we may have more of a typical Archean vein deposit there. So we're, we're working on the geometries of that right now. That interpretation is, is of course tricky as Archean gold usually is. So uh, it's been fun. And have you done petrography? I, I know, um, Eben, I will come and I'll ask you a whole bunch of questions, but um, you know, there's always an overlap between the, the geology and the mineral processing and the projects. Um, but, um, Maura, you know, have you, have you been selecting kind of the samples for petrography and, um, you know, looking at the alteration? Is it silicified? You know, tell me a bit more about that. For the exploration targets, we're just in the throes of that right now. So we've uh, been repulling core sections that we think are mineralized. And like I said, we're working towards uh, a press release soon to, to go over those results and what they mean. Um, but yes, we've, we've picked some of the samples to go for petrography to see, are we dealing with the same host rocks or different and how do they fit into the overall picture? Um, as well as we're doing geochem on all of the, um, all of the exploration holes. So putting that all together will be a big focus for us in the coming months. Um, you know, we're, we're have a pretty uh, wet breakup coming ahead of us. So we're, we're going to spend a lot of time work focused on interpretation so that the second half of this year, we can really go guns blazing on any follow-up exploration from field work to drilling. Would you describe your kind of exploration or your kind of logical effort as relatively vanilla? Um, or have, have you got any kind of secret source that we need to know about um, in terms of, um, I don't know, looking at trace element ratios or some terra spec work or I mean are you doing anything fancy or is it just um meat and two veg um ge geology that, yeah I find that if you do the basics really well you kind of get to the right answers for a good price tag so you know I think that often we don't do all the hard work to, to get there so we're spending a lot of time on the interpretation side and if we find that um, we see something from the geochemistry that we've done that will warrant additional, we'll go to that. I'm not afraid to use any tools at our disposal, but more uh, focus on the structural interpretation. So using oriented core and going out and, and field mapping uh, and getting those structures you know, underfoot and saying, oh yes, it's truly here where we thought it would be. That's really important. And those back to basics, I think, find you a lot of gold, especially in these systems. You've got a huge amount of drilling. I was gobsmacked by your um, your your drill meterage database. You've got what's it over five hundred thousand meters of core. Um, I can't find the exact. There were three thousand one hundred eighty five drill holes and over five hundred forty thousand kilometers of drilling. You know, you must have a pretty big core shed. And have you taken RQD uh, and density date um, measurements right through that? I mean, have you got a complete data set? We do. We have a really great data set and it's amazing. I, I was super impressed coming here that it's stored so well that we can go back and pull core from Goliath and Gold Lunge. Like both companies took a lot of care to save that core. So we've been able to go back and pull historic uh, drill core, look at it and, and try to understand things better. Um, it, it's really impressive. But I must stress too that that drilling is mainly on Goliath proper and Goldland proper. So there isn't very much drilling and very much work on the exploration front. So, you know, a lot of that drilling has been concentrated and the whole belt is pretty open. Maura, thank you so much. I'm I'm just looking at the clock and I realise that I'm, I've been sucked down my own rabbit hole of geology and I, I, I should hit myself over my risk and uh, let's talk about projects. So, so Eben, thank you for being so patient for so long. Um, the 
the the PEA, did, did you work on that original PEA that was put out? Uh, or you know, when did you join the team? No, so I'm also fairly new to the team. I, I joined um, in the beginning of September last year. Um, so kind of at the start of the PFS that, that's currently on the way. And what's your what's your background? You know, what had what's your route into the the the, the company? I notice you've got a, a, um, a South African accent, so you're obviously not a native to Canada, but uh, Canada's a, a nation of great immigrants. So you you know, what was your route? Yeah, so I uh, I started off in in the mining industry um, in South Africa as well, um, close on twenty years now, and then progressed out of operations into projects. Um, and pretty much been in the project environment for 13 years, so um, which includes building projects in Africa, um, feasibility studies and projects in India, and feasibility studies and projects, execution projects in South America. Um, so in and around August last year, um, we were introduced to, to Jeremy, and, and yeah, pretty much the um, rest of it is uh, history. So you've, you've built a few projects, you've done yeah. a feasibility on a few projects and probably seen them going to production. So you've, you, yeah. you've seen how things can go wrong. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, I do, I do take it quite seriously because there's, like you say, I mean, uh, a big part of my job is, is really managing the risk from the feasibility study now and into construction um, mm. because there are a lot of things that, you know, get um, get prioritized now over and above the the risk. So that's where I'm trying to spend. And we're just getting going with the PFS now, following the the resource update. So I'm spending a lot of my time trying to bring in that sensibility. And I think the team is, as a as a as a whole has that ability because all of us come from either operations or projects or a combination of both. So bringing in that real world experience makes a big difference to how we approach the PFS. One of the one of the key things, as I understand, a kind of a PSFS to do is, is you know, there's that that that, that phrase that um, a PEA is what it might be, and a PFS is what it should be, um, and a feasibility study is what it will be. Um, so, really, in the PFS, what you're effectively doing is is a whole series of kind of parallel option studies and trade-off studies right. dynamically and presenting results in all of them, but with a selection on the the best fit um, kind of option um how do you kind of approach those you know that, that that dynamic because it's a very very dynamic environment you've got exploration happening around you've got um you know new data coming in you've got this kind of envelope of mineralization changing are you effectively saying well we know what we've got at goliath we know we've got what we've got at miller and at goldland so let's wrap the plan around that and we can flex the optionality with any exploration success we may or may not have beyond that. Yeah, that, that's essentially been the approach. Um, and towards Q4 last year, what we also did was we, we looked at a number of trade-off studies to understand how the, the changes in both the resource and the eventual reserve could drive these, um, these trade-off studies and the outcomes of them. So that we... Um, you know, it's been a lot of parallel work streams, everything from drilling and, and geology to um, metallurgical test work to geotech programs. So it's been a really important understanding how the um, how each of those or how each of the variables that will eventually make up the PFS have an impact on things like the financial model, things like the capital estimate, things like OPEX. Um, so we've done quite a lot of work in parallel to get uh, the the series of trade-offs that we're looking at to a point where we can now start to plug in the details and and still test um, or still um, keep the the our options open in terms of exploration targets opening up in the next two years and what does that do to our sequencing and our mine plan? So. That's been a that's been a big big part of the of the focus in at the end of last year and uh, up until now really. Thank you. Um, you mentioned metallurgical testing, and you also earlier you said that there are different responses uh, at Goldland to Goliath. Could you just talk to me about what you've discovered through the metallurgical test work? What it's looking like in terms of grind sizes, hardness, recoveries, process options? Yeah. So we um, 
through uh, following the PEA last year, we we went through a, a very detailed set of metallurgical test work that included specifically around Golden, that included um, uh, deportment and diagnostic studies. Um, we saw early on um, differences in in um, grade recoveries between Goldland and Goliath. So we, a lot of that effort was to try and understand how we could bring up the, the recovery at Goldland um, to match Goliath so that it gives us that flexibility to run different blend scenarios. And the and same sorry, thing we, yeah. sorry, just, just, just to interrupt, the, the, the lower recoveries from Goldland, is that a, a, a grain size um, function or is it convert occlusion in pyrite? You know, what, what, was, what, was the, what, what was the challenge that you had to overcome? Um, it is it's it is a number of things, grind being one of them. Um, so we we looked at different scenarios and to to without you know without negatively impacting the flow sheet that we'll be selecting through the PFS, you know, we tested different grind conditions versus different leach conditions, a combination of blends to understand what the optimal um uh so not the, the optimal recipe uh, will look like. So that trade-off is going to be wrapping up in the next month and a half, um, month, month and a half from now. Um, and that'll drive the, the process selection, but also will incorporate things like the other two. Uh, so the other two trade-offs that are quite important to us is um, the haulage or transport from Goldland and Miller to Goliath. Um and then looking at our capacity and throughput and seeing if there's options or opportunities there between those two. So for us, you know, with all of the work that's been completed, it's um, uh, a lot of that has really been driven by the resource estimate, which is thus obviously done. And then um, seeing how that evolves into a reserve and the mine plan and the sequencing of the mine plan between the various deposits. Lots of information. Thank you. Um, uh, when you look at, uh, ha have you published metallurgical stuff? I mean, do do you have a kind of a grind size in your head? And um, so, so I should just kind of just sit back and wait rather than <laughs> the, rather than push for answers. Okay, yeah, good. Just, just 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 so I know. Um, <laughs> so I won't ask for you an exact grind grind size or hardness um, or preferred route. But um, what I can ask is, is it? It's presumably it's sulfide right from the top because it's um or you know it, there's not much from the oxide layers there or, or you know what's the profile down structure or it's very much it, consistent um sulfides so you'll see in the i mean you'll you'll see in the parameters right that we've done quite a lot more work to understand that regression whereas the pea used a very simple um recovery um on average grade for each of the deposits so we've got a much better understanding of that now that translates into a natural regression curve. Um, for Goldland specifically, we've done more work to understand if, you know, are we talking about, because we, uh, um, as you would have seen from the resource shell and different zones in the block model, um, how those different zones um, behave differently and does it warrant um, uh, their own regression uh, curves and there's a bit more work that will obviously need to happen through feasibility study, but that's that's the approach we've taken. Luckily, you've got lots of core that you can uh, process for, for metallurgical yeah. test work. <laughs> um, and when you look at uh, trade-off studies on the trucking, it, it, effectively, you, um, just, just thinking off the top of my head, the three choices you've got, you've got a conveyor system, you've got a um, kind of a, a beneficiation, kind of producer, kind of a first stage of pro processing or selection at, at Goldland and or road trains or, you know, uh, uh, am I missing something? What else are you kind of playing with? Yeah, there's, there's various materials handling options that we've looked at from continuous to batch processing. Um, and then the different throughput rates that we've, that we've looked at. And again, that's now that we have um, resource done, the next step is going to be looking at um, uh, mine scheduling and the sequencing of the deposit. So that we understand each of those, um, um, solutions come with their own risk and opportunities. We've looked at dynamic simulations in 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 
all of those have made it past the first line of assessment or the, the, the first um, round of assessment for the trade-offs. Um, and now that we start to get into the thick of the mind schedule and the sequencing around it, now we can start to, to narrow down those options to a final base case. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Jeremy, could you remind me of the, kind of the, the headline figures from the PEA, just in terms of just kind of provide some context? It was PEA came in 328 million NPV, 30.2% um, IRR at post tax at $1,600. Uh, good numbers. That's, yeah, good numbers. I, I seem to recall you were using a 5% discount rate just, just to complete the. So, um, and the. You know, we've, we've got a change in dynamic. You've got. Um, uh, you've got a higher gold price, but we've got inflation. You've got higher fuel costs. You've got higher steel costs. Um, is, is it likely that the, the margin stays the same or does the rise in the gold, gold price on a, uh, kind of on a one gram uh, global resource, does that make such a difference that you expecting much better results from the, the pre-feasibility or is it too early to tell? It's, it's too early um, to get into the, you know, the exact side of that. But what, you know, we are working, obviously, with all the other. There are quite a few mines being built in Ontario. So we're learning from what's going on. I think the important thing is we're not just looking at, we've taken the financial model and we're looking at attacking it from a cost perspective um, and a revenue perspective. So, you know, we've looked at things like infrastructure where we see some significant opportunity for savings in CapEx. We've looked at tailings where we see opportunities for savings in, in CapEx. And then on the MET test work, we're looking at the revenue side. So yes, we are going to get hit with inflation. We are going to get hit with fuel costs. Um, I also think though we must just, our study was done in the middle of COVID, so it already incorporated some of the changes. It didn't incorporate maybe the world we're in right now, but we also need to be careful not to knee-jerk into everything. We're only building, we're taking a construction decision in 18 months' time, and we'd be in operation in three and a half to four years' time. So it's it's not that it's being built right now. So we are still looking with, with the other producers, looking at, at rolling averages rather than exact spot prices at the moment. Yeah, well, yeah, you, you've got to take a... You've got to take a long-term view on input costs and also revenue, and it would in the form of the gold price, metal prices. You don't you don't want to take uh, decisions based on a intraday gold price. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, good. Um, in Jeremy, you've been listening while I've been talking to Evan and um, to Laura. You know, are, are there aspects of my line of inquiry that you feel are kind of um, are missing? You know, things, you know, what would you like to emphasize from the discussion that I've had um, so far with your team? Merlin, I think, you know, in the 18 months that, that I've been on board, we've we've gone through a process of, we got, when the PEA went out, we had a lot of shareholders and investors telling us that, you know, they thought it was bigger, they thought it would be in production earlier, and they, there were a lot of promises that hadn't necessarily been met in the past. So for us, it's a credibility story. We said we would do the things we've done them. You know, the, we now have funding to take us to the next phase. We have the resource estimate has gone out. We have the team in place. And really for us now, it's, it's execution. We need to go through, get the PFS done, immediately get into the FS, get all the community work uh, done, get the permitting done, and push this project through to a construction decision in, in Q4 of 23. So I think, you know, from, a, from our perspective, we, we're excited about what we achieved in 21. Um, we're still getting some good results from some of the drilling back in 22. Um, and, you know, it's now it for us is take it through the last stages and execute. It's, it's take it across the finish line um, and, you know, excited about that. I think this year for us is we see it as a transformational year. Yeah, and absolutely. And that's one of the benefits of um, 
being a new a new team. I mean, you you said you've been with the company for eighteen months. Um, Eben, you, what is it, eight or nine months now? Yeah. Um, uh, Laura, perhaps you're. Um, sorry, Maura, you're perhaps the uh, uh, not quite, but getting on for the 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 the, the grey hair in the team. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> But the, the, the benefit of coming in as a kind of a relatively fresh team is that you can reset the expectations. You can re, reset the way that you communicate with the, with the market and you can say, this is how it is today. And these are the things that we can control. And we're going to deliver on the bits that we, let, we're going to focus on the stuff that we can do. And it's up to the market to, to, to take a view on the gold price or whatever it is or the um, political risk in Canada. Absolutely. And we, we say that regularly. There are only so many things we can control. So we are um, we are flat out with those areas. The ones that we can't control, um, we have to leave. And obviously, they will fit into our studies. But it doesn't help getting all worked up about things that you actually have no control over. And just, just to jump back to the PEA, that was, it, was a, um, it was envisaging a, about 100,000 ounces per annum, wasn't it? Correct. Life, us, life of mine. Yeah, for us, the, what we saw as the critical mass was a million ounces, 100,000 a year for 10 years. And we, we achieved that in the PEA. It was about 13 or 14 years, um, just, un, just over 100,000 for the first nine years and then into some of the, the stockpiles after that. And with the resource increases now, we see our opportunity to, to grow that. The other thing that we had a challenge with in the PEA, Merlin, was our conversion from the measured indicated to a mine plan was about 50%. And that's low. So part of the challenge for us is, and this is where it was so important to get that definition in the resource and to increase the resource because it allows us to grow that mine plan. Because at the end of the day, the economics are in the mine plan, not the resource. So we've done all the hard work to give us the tools to grow that mine plan or reserve into the PFS. Good. Um, now, at the beginning of the, the, this, this interview, you laid out what you're going to be doing over the next 18 months. So just, just as a kind of a conclusion, could you just um, remind me one more time of the, kind of the, the key milestones you're going to be looking for in the next um, uh, seven or eight quarters? So first thing, we'll, we're going to continue with the exploration results as they come back from the assays, uh, from the laboratories. Um, second half of this year, we'll get the PFS finalized. We'll immediately kick off into the FS. We are continuing all the way with permitting and um, community engagement. So that continues without stop. And into... Um, the second quarter of next year, we would be looking at the, the feasibility study being completed um, and then a construction decision in Q4 of next year. And then 18 to 24 months to build it and then into operations. So those are the it's, – it's, it's a tough time for us in that we're busy with studies and we're busy with drilling uh, assays are slow coming back, so there's not always a lot of news. So this has been quite significant for us. The last two weeks, we've had a mineral resource update and the closing of a royalty that funds us for the next 18 months. So it's been quite significant news up now, um, and now we get into more routine stuff. The next major event for us will be the, feasible, the pre-feasibility in, uh, in the second half of the year. Well, Eben, Mora. Jeremy, thank you so much. I've really learned so much about your company in, in less than an hour. Um, I wish you every luck with your work programs going ahead. And um, um, perhaps if you'd come back and we could do another one, perhaps when you got the um, pre-feasibility study out, um, it'd be, a, I think, an opportune time. Perfect. We look forward to it. And thank you for your time, Merlin. It's been a pleasure.